initially my background started in the world of sport and I was very interested in sports science. I'm in my 70th year now. So, so there wasn't much around then. And basically um, I started to get involved in sporting performances. And now, as most of you know, that's a very big science. And there's all kinds of things happening now in that area. Um, and right at the very beginning of that journey, uh, myself and two others, one who was Jim McGregor, if anybody knows football, mm -hmm. He was Manchester United physio of 13 years. I was in the military for nine years. Um, that was from 84, 1984, which is kind of around the Gulf War starting, uh, to uh, 19, 1984 to 1993. But I must say I was a medic. So, you know, it wasn't my job to shoot people. It was really fixing them. And it didn't matter which side they were on either. <laughs> so, so I have that background as well as an emergency medical technician. So, um, and I was also involved with with three other people. Um, one, a young doctor. This is at the RMC Royal Army Medical Corps Training Centre to develop the first aid training for medics at that time because it was very antiquated. We were able to start the four of us to develop what is now the advanced trauma modules for all army medics, which for them it involves going out to the states, to the sort of cities that are riddled with gun crime. Uh, and so they work in the theatres pretty much every day with gunshot wounds. Um, so, it, you know, it's quite technical now and quite thorough. Uh, so I had a, quite a length of time involved with that. And moving on really quite quickly, um, I actually set up a school, an alternative education program for Manchester's youth gang scene. And the first co-op group was Moss Side. It doesn't come any more serious than that, really. So we managed to get 11 and I designed a training educational system that hopefully would work with them. Everybody else thought this was crackers and it wouldn't last nine days, it wouldn't last nine weeks, it wouldn't last nine months. And it actually ran for nine years with three offset inspections, three yearly, all outstanding. So it's about how do you do something? But when I was first doing this kind of a talk, um, it, it was very, very new. Um, and a little bit later on, I'm gonna try and do some practical demo of perhaps being, inter being able to interfere with people's ability to perform. And looking around the room right now, we've got quite a few strong people. So hopefully <laughs> one will volunteer to come down, uh, male or female. And um, I'll, I'll try and do and demonstrate that, but more of that in a little while. Really what I'm going to start off by doing is uh, there are no slides in this. So, you know, I'm just going to throw some questions out there sometimes. Um, obviously feel free to chip it in, uh, you know, if there's a question going out. Um, so in this thing now, I'm going to name it primary human energy drivers. Has anybody heard that term before? Apart from those who I've worked with, by the way. <laughs> so you cannot say nothing. <laughs> right. Okay. Um, but as I say that phrase, I'd like to see what you guys think is what potentially, and I'm talking about seriously upstream primary human energy drivers. OK, so what is it that drives us to be able to function or do things, whether, you know, whether you're in a, a doctor's, you know, sort of medically, uh, psychology or whatever field you're in? Obviously, we've got a near Wim Hof here. So we've got that yeah. side of knowledge and information as well. So does anybody want to say what they think that might stand for? There's a clue in the title. Go on. Yeah. I would say um, things like fear and love are the primary energy. Okay. Fear and love is... Yes, so they're, they're going to be in there, aren't yeah. they? So I'm getting seriously upstream. But these are what? What are they? Emotions. emotions. So he's mentioning the word emotions as a primary human energy driver. Okay. I'll ask another question because I think you're starting to get the idea. Is how many of them do you think there might be? So what I'm going to do in a minute is I'll put a number out, right? I'm giving absolutely no clues, okay? I'm going to start low down and work my way up as to how many of these there are. 
So all you need to do is raise your hand, tiny by your head, and we'll know how many. Um, so let's start with six or less. So it's a pretty small number. Right. So it's more than that. So if we double it to 12, so maybe 12 or less. Go on, Val. I was just going to say, uh, do you mean in... I'm not really sure what you mean. Is it? Are you talking about things like, say, whether people are positive or negative in how they feel, that sort of thing? Cause... Right. So if we take that upstream, I, I'm going to do this a bit later about taking it upstream because um, that's the real key, I think, in this. Um, and it's one way that I've found over three decades, basically, that people can start to get their head round what it is they might need to do, whoever they are, right? Um, so essentially, it will all come really clear in a minute, but I'm just interested, and the more, yeah, I'm not going to give any clues. up. We're now at, what, we're at 24 or less? I think less. Right, so you're going for less than 24. Yeah. All right, so we double that's 48 primary human energy drivers or less. Right, we've got a few takers now, and then we've got a few that's not. Okay, so we're looking now, 48. I should have said I have a brain injury, right? So I have post-concussion syndrome. Uh, but the worst part of it is cognitive function disorder. So it's quite difficult for me to kind of do what I'm doing right now, really. Uh, but so long as I can stay on track without anything coming from... I, I can deal with the questions because that's on track. It's them things that come... You know, if there was a noise out there or something, I'd have to make sure I don't even pay any attention to it. But that aside... Um, we're up in the 48s. There's still a few that are scratching. I'm now thinking, have I gone the wrong way? And are there actually just very few, but then there's like four or five, and then off them, there's so many more. That's why I keep saying the word primary human energy drivers. And in a minute, you'll see how all that fits together. Because sometimes we've got really complicated people that we're trying to help fix. Mm -hmm. And so if we can use a language that helps them to really understand perhaps where I'm going, and I'm sure Lynn's probably grinned a few times in what I've said so far. Um, so what we're now starting to ch chase, right, um, through Damon is this idea that, you know, going seriously upstream. So emotions, where do emotions spring from? In your brain. Right. So what we're now starting to say is that if we start going upstream, we're now at a brain, okay? So we've got the word brain mentioned. and obviously. Emotions and things like that happen physically in that physical structure of a brain. But what else could we attach to the brain that is... Some people think that, that it may be inside the brain, but there are a lot of people who can show that it's actually outside the brain as well. So what would that be? Our consciousness. Consciousness can be inside the brain. Uh, so consciously we're aware through our brain thinking but sometimes maybe something's happening that is at a subconscious level or an unconscious level. So it, what about in your tummy, in your guts? And... Right. So something else can get affected by the brain, right? Uh, but I'd like that other word that can be so attached to the word brain. Mind. The nervous system. Mind. Yeah, oh. <laughs> no, I was thinking about you, that the primary drivers for, for us are... Our... It's our autonomic nervous system, so our fear, our fight, flight, response, our protective reflexes, yeah. actually, because the brain is about really keeping us alive. Yeah, these different parts of the brain that come together to give us that ability to fight, flight, freeze, you know, or even flop these days is in the mix. Um, yeah. So I think a lot of people have that there. So that's the brain. So the discussion right now, and I'm going to try and keep this as brief as possible, is about mind. So. Are you, is everybody here accepting that there is a mind belonging to people as well as a brain? Yeah. I'm not. You're not. <laughs> okay, that's fine. I always think if it is the same, really. I don't know. Right. Um, so I was just going to say the only reason I've, I feel that the mind might not be there is because it's a construct that was developed how long ago? Um, and because I work with the future, what will the future actually bring to say that it's a biochemical reaction yeah. taking place in our brain? Yeah. And what is a mind? So if we had to cut open your head, where would we find your mind? And they've, had, they've tried that in the past, but, <laughs> but that was crazy days. So I, I 
would agree in terms of how I see it as an in, the brain is integrated. There are so many different layers yeah. of connectivity yeah. within it, but yeah. it is one unit. Yeah. And I think we like to separate it out because yeah. it helps us to understand. Okay. But actually the brain doesn't separate out. Right. It is constantly different layers of connectivity and networks okay. going on all the time. So I see it as an integrated unit, yeah. actually. So what we're saying then is one definite area that's very much upstream is to do with the brain, right? And things going on in that brain, either at a conscious level within the brain or a subconscious level within the brain. But the other thing that I've just introduced is this issue of mind, okay? Um, and again, there's lots of work going on at the moment to try and establish what that is, but it's really difficult. So that's for another day. So essentially, though, we could have this area that is brain-mind. And maybe I'll put everybody at ease right now, because the true answer really is that it's six or less primary upstream drivers as to how we function in all that whatever we do. OK, so I'm now going to try and legitimize that or justify it. I think most people would agree that the brain slash mind, if that does or doesn't exist, is going to be one of those upstream drivers. I'm quite animated at the moment. <laughs> so, and I did my safety brief. Okay, so what am I doing now that is a primary driver for the vast majority of humans? Um, I was just wondering if bringing it back to that part there, and you mentioned the word there. So, from a mammalian mind yeah. slash brain yeah. Yeah. perspective. Yeah are the drivers that you're trying to sort of take to is around safety, survival? That's all in there, isn't it? Because that happens in an almost mechanical way, chemical signals going out and, you know, and all the receivers, the sender parts of them, the receiver parts of them doing their thing, and we get that response in that, don't we? Um, so I think everybody's in agreement that that's got to be up there as a primary human energy driver. So what I'm trying to seek now, we know we're looking for six or less, Right, is what other thing is there? And you know, I'm moving lots at the moment, I'll just go for a jog. So, what else for most humans is a primary assistance to them to be human and to help okay. them forward in whatever they do? If I do exercise, physical activity, yeah, moving. So, physical now, physical can exist like I've been trying to demonstrate, right. Um, so that's me doing physical movement stuff, right? But I have to coordinate that through the brain. And so so those two together, for most people, that's why I said most people, you know, have that ability to move, to create, to want to do something, to come here today, you know, planes even for some people, buses, trains, right? So physically, that's got to be up there, I would think. Is everybody, most people in agreement with that? Yeah. So we've got mental, mind, we've got physical, so we're, they're adding up. Spiritual. <laughs> okay, that's really good, you know. And I've been doing this presentation for over 30 years. So we've got, we've got physical, we've got brain, mind, and the, the, the other suggestion was about spirit. Uh, and I touched on the fact that a lot of years ago, I talked of it as spirit. But in the, in the auditorium or small group, whatever it was, it, it dichotomized in, down to two roads, either spiritual as in Christ and God, that side of it, or spiritual as in woo-woo sort of crazy world. Um, and, and sometimes there were 200 people there. And so it starts getting into a like them and us. you know. Uh, so that's when I coined the phrase, the spirit of self. Because even medical people, you know, whatever field they're in, don't have a problem with that. But whenever I do this with more, far more medical people than anybody else, it, it gets quite difficult because they have a structure that they work to. I think, does, is everybody comfortable with the phrase spirit of self? So we see it in patients sometimes and it slaps us in the face. Um, so I've got a question coming from. Okay, there. I was just wondering if you wanted more. I was then my brain was thinking, well, environments. So the the environment itself. So so if if we had to go and live in a in a um, above the snow line in Canada, 
mm. in an ice hole so we don't get to be, build an igloo. You know, that, that's going to be like, I don't you'd like it. <laughs> so I'm speaking to a Wim Hof instructor here, you know, so maybe that wasn't the best line to go down. Um, but the environment, which is the point you were making, mm. the environment then affects the brain, mind, right? Physically, it will affect you. But it's kind of where your brain and mind is as well as to whether you endure something without being too fixated in that so that you can function in another way. Another question. Graham, can I just ask you to go back to say, why does it, the spirit of self actually slap you in the face? Well, it's not me that it slaps in the face because no, I, I, you know, I've been down this rabbit hole for a very, very long time. But it's other people trying to understand what that is. I'll give you one quick example of it. Part of my military life, funnily enough, back in Canada, above a snow line, surviving for three months and having soldiers come. I, my job was a medic, right? But one of the tasks they had to do in what's called full fighting order. So they've got, at best, 40 kilograms they're carrying. Some of the other, like the machine gunners and people like that, they're in 60 plus kilograms. But luckily, they didn't have to carry the um, sort of machine gun, GPMG, general purpose machine gun, and all the rounds, they just had to be in fighting order. So that's down to about 25 to 30 kilograms. Medics actually have got more weight than the infantry. And that table, probably slightly longer, three meters, a little bit wider than that. My job was to dig a hole in the ice in the lake to make a pathway that they could jump in. Right. So some of these were relatively young lads. Um, and what they had to prove to themselves was they could literally jump in, go across, and climb out at the other side unaided, right? So it means unaided. <laughs> My job as a medic, I was the only one that could say, we're going to pull them out. And nobody, you know, even their captains or whoever, can't pull them out of there until I say yes, right? So it's a bit of a responsibility. And a number of times during that three months, when they get to the other side and they struggle on the first attempt, they try again. Some get out on the second, some get out on the third. But there's those after the third attempt where it starts getting really difficult. Because within 40 to 45 seconds, your muscles start tightening up. Um, and also the funny thing that you learn is when you jump in and you come up, you won't be able to breathe for relatively split seconds. So don't panic because that just makes it worse. Just try and relax and all of a sudden you'll have a massive big breath in. So we teach them all these things, but actually doing it is another matter. And as you can imagine, sometimes somebody gets to the other side, fourth and fifth attempt not getting out. I've got captains looking at me to want to pull him out. And in all that three months, did I pull any of them out? No, I didn't pull a single one out. But there must have been in that three months probably getting on for a dozen where I was thinking, you know what, I need to pull them out. But something happens. They're, yeah, they were all males actually on that because it's going back a bit. There's females now in this and stuff. Um, what happens is they look up at me because they know I'm the one that says, yeah, pull him out. Um, so they look at me, but they don't speak. I think that's a typical male thing. You know, they don't want to ask for help, right? But they look at me as if to say, I want you to pull me out. And I, I don't do anything, you know, other than just looking back. Uh, I might say, you need to get out. You, know, you need to get out really soon. And so they go back. They'll perhaps have another attempt. And they fail on that one. This time they look and they ask, pull me out, pull me out. You know, and as I'm going to look at somebody here right now, right? <laughs> right? I'm not pulling you out, right? What if this is you somewhere on your own? You need to pull yourself out. So that's all I say. And it was pretty much the same little sentence all the time. What happens is they, they kind of look at me to realize that they're not going to get pulled out. And they go to a space then that is deeper than maybe where they've ever been in their life because they really think they want to die. Um, you know, I've had that experience a couple of times. But, but when you're in that space, you connect to something that's deeper than yourself. And you know, every, every single one of them pull themselves out. And the other amazing thing, later in the day, right, not when anybody's around, every single one of them comes to me and gives me the biggest hug you can imagine. 
you know, and say thanks for not pulling me out. Because what we've done, if we go brain mind side, is belief system. So they've grown a belief that they didn't have before. But to grow that belief, they had to understand the spirit that is within themselves. And that's why I think it's a very, very real and tangible thing. Okay. One of the challenges with is there's probably there's probably so many different words for like yes survival instinct intuitive and yes but at the heart of it I guess yeah. It's yeah. spirit. I am going to come to that, you know, yeah. a bit later. But <laughs> that that gets really quite big and shrouded. But mm. for now, I think most people are in agreement that we have this brain mind thing going on as a primary driver because we can change that. Psychotherapists, psychologists, and and all the other healers, you know, are very very good at that. Um, I'm sure most of you know Gabo Mate. Um, you know, he's been influenced a lot by some of the ancestral stuff. Um, and a lot of his work is pretty prolific and and has a lot of merit these days. So, but we're still looking for another one. And it's actually a slightly easier one than that one. That's usually the one that comes last and takes a bit of digging for, spirit of self. So we've got physical, we've got chemical. I've just given it here. Hormones. <laughs> <laughs> right. So what are we? primarily made up of humans, or trees, or the planet. Cells. Cells. cells, yes, but cells have chemical structures. So I'll give you a big clue because I'm going to try and speed it up. H2O, what is H2O? Water. Yeah, so water is a chemical. What is a human primarily? Water. What are bones if we pull a bone apart to cellular level? But they're different structures, but the structures are cells, like a tree. A tree is actually pretty much close to 80% of water. Most of the earth is 80% obviously seawater, but and all the other lakes and stuff. So chemical. So would you guys accept that maybe one of these upstream primary human energy drivers is chemical? Yeah. So what we've got there then is four things that it, whatever you throw at me next, because I'm going to ask you to do that, Something that might be outside of those four. So I'm suggesting that as super upstream primary human energy drivers for all of us boils down to four things. I know there's a lot of stuff in each one of those four and how it can be changed. And I'm going to do some practical demos in a minute. And this again is 30 plus years ago, uh, but I'll do that in a second. So four things. Um, the, the next question, which is pretty much the last one, do you think there's an order of importance of those four? So could we put one on top, another one, second, third and fourth? Do you think that might be possible? Everybody's thinking quite hard at the moment. I'd, I'd say you no, know, I need to work together. Right. That's great. Right. I'm coming to that. But, but at the moment, as a single entity, right, because obviously if we look at mental health conditions, they have a myriad of things, you know, um, not least one person today is going to speak on uh, fibromyalgia, if we use that as an example. And, and it may be that we have chance somewhere else to add to this if we, if we need to. Because the second part of this is about performance and energy. So for us to perform and for us to have the energy to get through our day, whatever that is, the soldiers to get out the other side of the water thing, right, is that we have to be able to deliver ourselves in whatever it is that we're doing so performance and energy we need to be able to perform and we need to be able to have the energy to do that but the effects of positive and negative influences so if we have a positive influence in there one would expect that it you know things are brighter and better but if we have something say majorly negative in there then it can be quite detrimental so for example of that is seriously bad news you know husband losing a wife you know to be married for 55 years or 60 years or whatever is that it will have a knock-on effect with other things right um so in that example that i've just given the loss of somebody very close and very dear sometimes they pass out and fall on the floor so there's a myriad of these four, but if we trace them back, all those four things are coming together because they all speak to each other. 
everybody knows what a spinning top is. Yeah. Um, so you just have the spinning. I tried to get a really big one, but I couldn't find one anywhere. So I've got this little thing. You plunge the top, don't you? And it spins around. And you can let go of it and everything's happy. I want you to imagine that spinning top divided into four. So it's four segments. And we've got these four primary human energy drivers in there. And we start spinning it. The whole thing will stand up. So it stands up on that little narrow point at the bottom, right? While these four things are whizzing round. So if we have an effect, however small, on one of them, is it going to affect the other three? Yeah. It doesn't matter which one of them you have an effect on, it will affect the other three. I'm going to do this practical demo in a minute, you know, which I'm going to use strength, muscle resistance work. I don't know, have you done muscle resistance work? Yeah. I've done this with, actually, the last football team I worked with was Coventry City, which then days was first division, with Gordon Strachan and, and loads of others. I'm yeah. not going to go to more of the story of that, other than I say to them, like I'm saying to you, could I interfere with your physical capabilities to perform at my beck and call without even touching you, and, and suddenly you don't perform very well? Is that possible? Oh, nearly everybody's saying yes. Right, that's different than two decades ago. <laughs> no, yeah. uh, so I basically need a volunteer if anybody's willing to come out. I've set this little bit up behind me um, so that I can and perhaps demo it. It's very rare that it doesn't work. However, if people have done lots in sports psychology and performance, they may be able to change that. Um, so why don't I get on and do that? Yeah. You want to have a go at that? I ah, okay. Uh, so we've got a volunteer. So your first name? James. James. James is going to come up. He's definitely taller than me. Uh, hey, James. No, this, it's not trick play, right? Nothing up with sleeves. Whatever. Right. But you look like you're healthy and fit. Okay. <laughs> um, so strength is something that most people have to one degree or another. Yeah. Okay. So what I'd like to do with everybody sort of witnessing this is a very, very simple demonstration of that. So I'm going to ask you to stand in what's called a horse stance. So we'll be doing it facing that board in a minute, right? But so that makes sure you're really grounded quite well. Okay? I'm not going to push you to the sides or back or front. And I'll, I'll show you. So what I'm going to ask you then to do is to bring your wrist up into the middle. You don't need to do anything just yet, right? So your wrist is in front of your sternum. Now, I'm going to lock all of this, right? I'm going to try and lock everything so that this becomes really strong. And what I'd like you to do is one hand, if you rest on there, just rest your hand on top of there. And what I want you to do is push that down, push it down. Go on. Is that strong? Yeah. So that you can see my legs actually, you know, because I was getting towards the limit, not so much of my arm, but just the fact that I'm demonstrating how strong I am. <laughs> so I'm going to ask you to do that in a second. But first of all, there's going to be nothing, all right? I just want you to show and for you to feel that, yeah, I'm pretty strong. So if you come out to that, just soften your knees a little bit more. Yeah, have that hand by your side. Now all of this needs to go straighten that out, straighten that out in front of your chest there and lock everything now so that everything goes really, really tight. I'm going to begin to press slowly and I'll keep pressing like you and you resist as best you can. You all right with that? So resist, resist, resist. Can you feel how strong you are there? Yeah. Right, okay, relax. So all we're going to do is that. But I have a little idea. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Is this in any way connected to Psyche K? That's new to me. I've been doing this for 30 years, so mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't know what that is. That might be something modern. Psyche <laughs> is to do with Kia. It's Kia. Based. Oh, energy. Mm. En yeah, yes. Mm. Kinesiology, muscle kinesiology, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, yeah right. very simple. Okay, so you lot and yourself at the moment are going to see the fact that I can draw a circle-ish, I can draw two eyes, I can draw a straight nose, you're with that, aren't you? And you're smiling, so, <laughs> so that's good. So you already know the horse stance, uh -huh. right? So bring out your right arm in front of you, get that elbow straight so that you can lock it and lock all of that off. You can have your hand behind your back, that's fine, it's up to you.
but just your eye contact in the drawing, you're smiling at them, so that's all right. But I want you to resist as best you can, just like you've done. You've already shown how strong you are. So, are you ready? Mm -hmm. Just resist, resist as best you can, keep resisting. Yes, that's very slightly down, but you can still see, can't you, that is proper doing good, isn't it? Right, this time I'm gonna ask you to turn the other way, briefly, okay? So, just look that way. Um, there's a few in this room that know what's coming. Do you not look at that camera? Okay, wait, wait, wait. So I'm going to do exactly the same. I'm not going to change anything, all right? Only will we turn, I'm going to ask you to turn around in a second. Uh -huh. And then when you turn around, if you can go into that same horse stance, get yourself locked up, you know, to resist as best you can. It's just that your eye contact again needs to be in the drawing. Yep. You're okay with that? Okay, so if you'd like to turn around. So your eye contact's in the drawing. Strengthen everything up, lock your elbow out, and be really, really strong and resist as best you can. Well, was that anywhere like as strong as you were before? No. no. I thought there would have been a lot of people here that have seen this and know this, right? The experience of this was a very long time ago. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, you will be able to again in a few moments. Yeah, I, I think it is worth me very quickly saying my experience of that a very long time ago. I was in a room with 16 other people. I was a cross-country skier. I'd just finished seventh in the British Championships uh, went and competed in Europe as well, but also shooting. Um, so that's biathlon. So I did both, uh, but I prefer the biathlon. Uh, so there were 16, you'd call them these days, elite athletes in the room. It, a, a chap that I come to meet that became a great friend of mine and changed my life that day. He was a Norwegian. His name was Harald Oyen, Harald Oyen. Uh, and he did exactly the same as this with me all them decades ago. When he asked for a volunteer, I'm quiet one, so I, I was kind of hiding. I'm in a horseshoe, a bit like this, and I was sat over there, and he's up there, right? And I'm trying to stay out of it. And all the other athletes... When I glanced more this way, because nobody seemed to be going out, we're all pointing at me because I was the cross-country skier, right? So obviously heart and lungs, upper body, lower body, and everything in between. Um, so I thought, oh, okay. And I, exactly what you've just seen now. The first one, strong as an ox. Second one, as strong as an ox. And the third one, when I turned around, I don't know what your experience is going to be, but when I turned around and I looked at a sad face, my exact words in my head, and I'm going to repeat them now is, you think that my arm's going to go down because I'm looking at a sad face. I'll show you, mate. I know my training program. And what happened? It went down like a hot knife through butter, an absolute hot knife through butter. And that day I said to myself, I know nothing. Who said that? Who said, I know nothing. Who was that? <laughs> I'm well, yeah, towers. I don't know. Is it? I don't know. But that's exactly how I felt. I knew absolutely nothing about how a human body works. And so I need to find out, and I became a good friend of his, and we did some work together with uh, the physio, Jim McGregor, uh, to try and bring sport into the next generation of where it is now. Finite analysis and stuff like that, because I've always been a fan of that. But when you work with someone and you're trying to change the, the, where they are, and I'm talking about people in very, very dark places, which I think most people here have got experiences of doing that. Um, I, I immediately, well, I, I know from experience, and some of that's going to come out in the presentations later, um, that if you can work with the spirit of who they are first, now that's a million dollar question, how do you do that? But if you work with the spirit of a person first, every, the other three will get such a boost, you know, that that the whole thing, and I'm going to, for the first time since I met the guy back in 2017, I think, uh, he's an ultra late stage cancer patient. Um, I'm actually going to share his case study that we did from Woodwork to Wellness, but more on that later. So I'm kind of going to round off there um, with primary human energy drivers, whether you're from the more medical sphere or whether you're from a counselling sphere or sports performance sphere or whatever sphere, is I think if you can get upstream to the point where you're trying to figure out where is most of this problem going on, is it within the chemical realm, in which case some meds are great, 
Um, and then, you know, kind of take it from there. So I'm going to open it up to questions. 